So, a Monday night mission for our girl in half an hour here on BBC One after Panorama with Jonah Fisher. It was a murder that sent shockwaves around the world. A prominent Russian journalist has been shot dead. Arkady Babchenko was an outspoken critic of President Vladimir Putin. Just weeks after the Novichok poisonings in Salisbury, another apparent attack on foreign soil. Boris Johnson has said he is appalled by the murder of one of Russia's best-known investigative journalists. But a day later, Arkady Babchenko was back from the dead. An anti-Kremlin journalist reported killed in Ukraine is actually alive. Tonight, for the first time, the inside story of the fake murder. They put pig's blood in my mouth. And then, when I was shot, I fell to my knees and coughed to make the blood splatter. Babchenko's wife tells her side of the story. You just can't believe it. You don't want to believe it. And we track down the hitman. It's a tale worthy of a spy thriller, but in an age of fake news, was the truth the real casualty? I'm Jonah Fisher. For the last few weeks, I've been on the trail of an extraordinary murder mystery. It happened here in Kiev, the capital of Ukraine. And at the heart of it is one man. Здравствуйте. Меня зовут Аркадий Бабченко. И я не знаю, кто я. У меня не осталось ни страны, ни родины, ни дома, ни имущества. Бабченко is a Russian journalist. He fled Moscow last year after receiving death threats and got a job with a Ukrainian TV station. He's an outspoken critic of Vladimir Putin. He's a usurper, a little dictator who lives completely in his own world. He wants to be like Napoleon, collecting together all Russian lands. But Ukraine, which sees itself as being at war with Russia, can be a dangerous place for Putin's opponents. In the last two years, several dissident Russian journalists and politicians have been killed in Kiev. Exactly who was behind the murders remains unclear. Our story begins earlier this year. Was Arkady Babchenko about to become the next target? Very nice to meet you. Welcome. How are you doing? I'm glad to see you. I'm happy to see you too. <laughs> Crazy times. Yeah. yeah. Alexei Simbaliuk is an unlikely assassin. He's lived as a monk and was once an Orthodox priest. And then when war broke out between Ukraine and Russian-backed rebels four years ago, he became a volunteer with the Ukrainian nationalist group. But it's quite an unusual combination to be a monk and a priest and also a killer. Zimbaliuk tells me how in April this year he met an old contact, an arms manufacturer called Boris German. Boris. 
Simbaliuk claims Girman was looking to arrange the murder of Arkady Babchenko on behalf of a wealthy client. And when he told you that he wanted you to kill Babchenko, what did you say? And did you plan to go through with it? Simbaliuk agreed to carry out German's request, but at the same time tipped off the SBU, Ukraine's intelligence service. They suspected Russia could be behind it and decided to stage the killing of the journalist. The SBU's boss is Vasil Khritsak. Why was the decision taken to fake Arkady Babchenko's murder? Because we were told that there were several units in Ukraine and that this assassination is just a test run for others. Only by staging this crime could we get the list of targets. We had to know more about who was involved in preparing and commissioning this terrible crime. The SBU rigged Simbaliuk up with a secret camera, which they say shows money being handed over for Babchenko's murder. What was the price for killing Babchenko? Did you discuss how the murder would be carried out? It was time to let Arkady Babchenko know that there was a price on his head. SBU agents told him of their audacious plot. They wanted to stage his murder to flush out those who'd ordered the killing. My first thought was not to trust them, that maybe it's a setup. I just wanted to grab my family and flee somewhere like Australia or Antarctica where they can't find us. But then it became clear to me, why should we run? Here are people who came to kill and we have a chance to stop them. We need to do this. Why should we do nothing? Now Arkady Babchenko had to let his wife Olga in on the plan. My first reaction was not shock, but fear. That awful fear when you realize this is not a movie or TV. This is really all happening right now to your family in your house. And you just can't believe it. You don't want to believe it. I asked Arkady, what are we going to do? Without hesitation, he replied he'd made a decision. We will catch these reptiles. A few weeks later, at the Babchenko's Kiev apartment, they had a visit from the fake assassin. The doorbell rang. I answered it, and the man said, hello. I am your killer. I wish you good health. Was it strange to meet the man who'd been picked to be your husband's killer? Yes, to meet the killer like this is, of course, very unusual. It's not every day you have a killer in your home. You smile when you talk about the assassin. It's almost like you quite liked him. He has a sense of humour. He does not look like a killer at all. According to the story we'd agreed beforehand, I came back from the grocery store. 
I opened the door, and at that moment I was supposedly shot in the back. When I was shot, I fell to my knees. SBU agents had arranged a makeup artist to help stage the murder scene. When I was lying on the floor, the makeup artist put pig's blood inside the bullet holes. My lips were smeared. They poured the blood into my mouth. They poured it underneath me. Fake assassin Alexei Simbaliuk and I retrace his steps from that night. Насправді на на хвилинку я уявив, якби це могло би бути жахливо. Babchenko's wife Olga had been waiting in the wings. Now it was time for her to take center stage. Когда киллер ушёл, after the killer left, I waited a little while. Then I called an ambulance. І я позвонила спочатку в скорую. I explained the situation that I'd come out of the bathroom and found my husband in a pool of blood. The police arrived quickly, after about five minutes. The first officers were aware of the special operation, but they also brought with them lots of other policemen who didn't know. My wife told them I'm a Russian journalist, and they all said, oh, here we go again. Paramedics were also soon on the scene. They'd been briefed on the fake murder plot and were ready to play along. They started to treat me because there were other people there who could see us through the window. We drove for a while and then, as planned, I began to die. Now the fake murder plot moved into its next phase, starting with a message to Arkady Babchenko's old friend and boss, TV journalist Ida Mushtabayev. We knew if we told Ida first, the news would spread rapidly. I took a car and immediately began to look for him in hospitals. As his wife told me, he was wounded and had to be taken away. On the way, I got the tragic news from police that he died in an ambulance. So I went straight to his apartment. It's a huge loss for journalism because he was one of the few individuals who wrote the real truth about Russia. And that's why he was killed. Ida arrived first. It hurts to remember how he wept like a child whose mother had just been killed in front of him. I've never seen a man cry so much before. He just howled. And how did that make you feel? Because of course you knew that it was all fake. To watch those close to you suffering is unbearable. We arrived at the morgue. Throughout all this, I had to act like I was a murdered man because there were journalists waiting outside.
The strangest two to three hours of my life was when I was sitting in the morgue, wrapped in a sheet like Gandhi, smoking and watching TV news about what a wonderful guy I was. And next door, a pathologist was soaring a skull, performing an autopsy. What were you thinking about while Arkady was at the morgue? I envied him because he didn't have to talk to anyone. I thought he was probably in a peaceful place at this point. And I was stuck in this agony. That night, the SBU leaked this picture of the fake murder scene onto social media. News of Babchenko's death was about to go global. One of Russia's best-known investigative journalists has died after being shot at his home in Kiev. In uh, the past, since he came to Ukraine, that he had been very critical of the Russian government. Russia has demanded a prompt investigation be carried out into the killing. The next morning, I went to the crime scene. Tributes were already pouring in for Babchenko. Friends began to collect money for his funeral. News of his death came just weeks after Russia was blamed by the British government for poisoning the Skripals in Salisbury. Russia was now being accused of involvement in the plot to kill Babchenko. We started to hear accusations of our country in being involved in this crime as it was presented by Ukrainian officials. Within a couple of hours, we were trying to plan how we can present the truth because we're accused in doing all evil on earth. Meanwhile, in Kiev, SBU agents had the middleman, Boris German, under surveillance, hoping it would provide conclusive proof that Russia had ordered the killing. Yes, we had a plan to wait for longer to allow things to develop. The next day, Boris German was supposed to pay off Zimbaliuk for the completed job, but there was lots of noise around the case. All the media was talking about it. At that point, we found German had bought a ticket to leave Ukraine, so we had to take some steps. SBU agents swooped on an unsuspecting Boris German. Twenty hours after the murder, the SBU called what seemed a routine press conference. No one expected this. Babchenko was back. Watching on, his colleagues at the news channel ATR, who'd been reporting on his death all day. When I saw him, I felt a huge sense of relief that he was alive. I ran outside and just lay on the grass for over an hour looking at the sky. It felt very good. First, I'd like to apologize for what all of you had to experience, for what you had to go through. I've buried friends and colleagues many times, and I know the sickening feeling. In particular, I would like to apologize to my wife for the last two days of hell, but there was no other option. Newsrooms across the world backtracked fast that anti-Kremlin journalist reported killed in Ukraine is actually alive. Well, Fred Pleitkin joins us again from Moscow with more. Yeah. Okay, so what's going on here, Fred? 
Yeah, I mean, it seems like a crazy turn of events. Sherlock Holmes faked his own death to elude his enemies, and incredibly, that's what happened here. Russian television took a very different tone. Все вместе это был большой спектакль от инсценировки убийства до голословных обвинений России в том, чего не было. Завтра мы тебя увидим. Babchenko made an emotional phone call to his own newsroom. В общем, все цветы, которые мы тебе собирали, мы тебя ними отшлёпаем, Да, я лично. Зачем? Babchenko's colleagues were delighted to welcome him back from the dead. But the questions soon mounted. Why had a self-styled truth-teller agreed to play the starring role in a fake news story? When they tell you someone is paid to have you killed, do you say, no, I refuse help? because it will violate the ethical standards of journalism. If you do that, people will be murdered because this network will not be exposed. Go on then, but I won't be part of it. So will we ever know the full truth about who wanted to kill Babchenko? The SBU say that when they arrested Boris Gurman, they found a hit list which he'd been sent from Russia. But they have yet to produce clear evidence of a link to Russia's security services. The role of the Russian security services in preparing the assassination of a Russian citizen and journalist, Babchenko, will be proved by us in court. I am sure of that. Russia crossed a red line a while ago. Russia is using illegal methods. Russia is trying to kill its opponents on foreign soil to intimidate those opponents who are still in Russia. This is ridiculous. This is absolutely absurd. Russia as a state has nothing to do with Arkady Babchenko. He's a free man in a free world. He can do what, whatever he wants. And actually, before uh, that, uh, that case, nobody even, I mean, in the international community, on a high level, nobody was, nobody has no idea uh, who is Arkady Babchenko, honestly. <laughs> If there is a Russian link, as Ukraine claims, it leads through the only man who's so far been arrested, the middleman. This is a court hearing for Boris Gurman, the man allegedly at the center of this plot. It's a chance for him to put his case and try and explain his role in this bizarre episode. Boris Gurman admits plotting, both with the fake assassin and a contact in Russia. But his defense is that he, too, was playing a role and was also working with Ukraine's SBU. Mr. Gurman, why should we believe that you didn't want to kill Arkady Babchenko? No, because I'm an idiot. Why do I need this? Why do I need this? I'm in my situation and I'm doing this Mr. Gurman, what this ultimately boils down to is, are you working as an agent for Russia? Mr. Gurman's story has changed several times, and despite repeated requests from the BBC, he's been unable to back up his claim that he was working with the SBU. So what are we to make of this extraordinary tale, where nothing is quite as it seems? We definitely believe the operation is a success. Even if you just save the life of Arkady Babchenko, it is a success. Thanks to this operation, we've also got a list of 47 potential targets. Journalists, activists past and present, citizens of the Russian Federation. Why should I believe what you're telling me now? I went out there and I reported what your organization told us that night. It turned, to be, it turned out to be lies. Now, 
You're speaking to me again. Is this the truth this time? This murder was being prepared for real. Real money was being paid. Other units were working for real, and the list of 47 potential victims is real. So the ends ultimately have justified the means? Definitely. But in the context of the propaganda war with Russia, could this end up being a massive own goal? Did they realize what they did? Because nobody will trust uh, Ukrainians and the uh, Ukrainian government uh, anymore in any sort of future cases. The show over. Its leading players are now trying to move on. What's next for you after this, Alexei? What's your future hold? Of course I am worried. I do not feel safe. At the moment, yes, we're in a safe place. But eventually it will be necessary to go out into the wider world. And what will happen then? We don't know. Arkady Babchenko may have been saved from an assassination, but he doesn't feel like a free man. How are you doing? Nice. Thank you. Okay, good. Just wearing your uh, disguise. I do not control my destiny anymore. Everything has gone down the drain. Life is once again broken. And still, you dare ask me why I criticize Putin so much? That's why I don't like them. Why the hell do they have to come here and kill people? The world is in the grip of an information war. A battle of facts against fakes, truth versus fiction, with trust, a priceless commodity. Babchenko survived, but the work of those fighting for the truth has become that much harder. Protecting a key witness and an outbreak of cholera. It's going to be a dramatic end to the current series of Our Girl, the penultimate episode next, and the finale tomorrow at 9, here on BBC One. Coming up at 10, the hottest day of the year so far, an amber heat health alert and temperatures are likely to rise. And a warning, a no-deal Brexit could damage British relations with the EU for a generation. Join us at 10. India has made me feel so alive. You just became part of it right away. Nine well-known pensioners look for a new place to call home. I'm so out of my comfort zone. Where are we going anyway? A brand new series of The Real Marigold Hotel starts Wednesday the 1st of August on BBC One. Operation Canvas is the first case involving so many people in the use of drones to fly drugs into prison. The prisoner was able to retrieve the package from the drone. They have evidence, but what they want to know now is how to build the strongest case. Prove it. You can't prove nothing. I've done nothing wrong. When you get to court, it's like going into battle. The Prosecutors starts with Prisons, Drugs and Drones, Thursday the 2nd of August on BBC Two. It's amazing to think my great aunt Annie marries Thomas Bryan. Within four months, he's arrested on very, very serious charges and he's in prison. It just feels like I'm climbing into a piece of really important Irish history. Mad that no one's ever talked about it. It will now. <laughs> Brand new Who Do You Think You Are continues with Boy George, Wednesday at 9 on BBC One.